Hello, here is part two. <laughs> Recorded at the same day and same time. Um, you could argue that that's for mooching as much ad revenue as I can get out of the system. <laughs> um, you could also argue that it's uh, for splitting things up into more segmented uh, discussions. So anyway, uh, I was going to look into the code base of Gearend a little bit more, and this time I'm going to look into the enemies uh, class. Um, so I've been refactoring, moving stuff around, uh, and so I have all my classes in a class file now instead of where it used to be, which is in here common, and that's after it used to be like inherent to the pl enemy. So I, s I have the old enemy code actually still around here, so you can see exactly how this works, um, or how it used to work. So yeah, it was bad. Um, <laughs> the character, basically I had a character variable that stored this uh, enemy class, the old enemy class, and it set some variables, you know, kind of some necessary stuff, made sprite maps uh, for sprites, and I'll kind of go into that, maybe uh, in like all of the BG Helper module that I have so far in another one video, or maybe go into like exactly what each part does or whatever uh, another time, but, um, well, I'll, I'll probably make a video for that like right now after this one, but anyway, uh, doing some necessary stuff, and then I go into this gigantic spiel, like, detailing exactly how the player, or I'm sorry, exactly how this enemy, the shooting sentry works. What he should be doing, how he should be shooting, what he, uh, what his state is, like if he's shooting, if he's preparing to shoot, if he's idling, if he's um, like charging down. It was just like, it was kind of, it was nuts just how much I actually coded. It's, it doesn't look like that much. It's not that much. I remember having a lot of trouble getting the transitions to work right. But it's like, you know, it's not that much. You have to write it once, right? But then... I have the same code pretty much again for the second century and that's because even though well basically there's different er uh, enemies right I mean they they do different things so I have different codes that's different code you know different functions that's stupid that's stupid of me past solar loon you suck <laughs> well not you suck but that's stupid because I can share so much of the code between them and so now we have this new system that's a lot simpler um, they don't do nearly as much, they share a lot more code, and they do a lot more that's the same, and that can be shared between objects. So let's kind of dissect how this works now. Um, basically, each enemy now inherits from a class, and that is a C character class. So I have a basic, basically an enemy function here called main that all enemies run, and basically it just runs the function that starts with C that has their name. So if there's a sentry, oops, if there's a sentry object, a sentry enemy, which there is in the resources tab, and his name should be like C in, uh, C sentry or something like that. I'm sorry, E sentry and E sentry two. Then what it does is it trips, uh, trims off the first character E, and adds a character C because it's, this is the C or a class. Uh, that's just a naming convention I have, but this the class is the sentry class. Um, and the Sentry 2 class, or the second Sentry class. And this is in the enemy um, file, so it didn't, didn't really make sense to me to have enemy.ce Sentry or something to that effect. So anyway, it just basically runs the function for the object using its name. And it gets the name of the function from globals. Um, globals. The Python globals function appears to return basically a, I guess you could say a list yeah, I guess it's a dictionary. It's a dictionary of names of classes and functions, um, and I guess it's mapped to actual references of those classes and functions. I'm guessing here. I, I don't quite remember. I just kind of read like, how do I do this without using the eval function? And that's why I found out. So anyway, let's go back. So anyway, it's running this uh, class for the uh, character or for the enemy. Each enemy has its own class because basically the main function just runs uh, regardless of the enemy and runs the update function on the class for each enemy. So anyway, um, these inherit these uh, enemy classes inherit from the C character class and it's doing like the old function did. It sets some necessary variables like the health, how much scrap each enemy drops, uh, that, that they're enemies in, in general, uh, that they're on the enemy team. And uh, sets uh, grabs their sprites and sets up sprite maps for their sprites uh, to like you know play a you know draw the the helicopter effect for the copter blades and open for the uh, sentry 
body and clothes for the sentry body when they're shooting. Something that's really, really, really nice that I implemented and didn't even think about was that um, I implemented this ability for functions, or I'm sorry, for animations to be able to play once instead of looping. That saved me so much time and effort because the old sentry code pretty much, like, it, like you can see, the body animation is open here, and then later on the body animation is shooting here, and then later on the body animation is closed here, and I have like checking to see if it's closed and if the sub uh, sub image exceeds the length of the cl oh man this was just I mean really lo look at this for a second if the body's animation is closed so if he's closing and the sub image of the body uh, sp body sprite or sprite map exceeds the length of the close animation minus one and he's not shooting anymore then go to idle that's so incredibly unnecessary and so the new version is a lot simpler yeah we just say basically if he's supposed to be if he's charging a shot and he's near um, you know going to shoot then we play the animation open and it's a one shot animation so we say play it constantly but it will just play once then if he's going into his cooldown state then he plays the close animation and it will stop when it's finished that's it the copter animation plays the copter animation. <laughs> the, the copter sprite map plays the copter animation. And he changes facing depending on where the target is or the player is. And that's kind of it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's you can see how much simpler it is. And you can say, well, where's this code that makes the character actually you know, approach and shoot and all that stuff? Um, and actually, the, the Sentry 2 class is pretty much the same in that it has specific uh, behaviors um, that, let's see, oh, I'm sorry, I w I'm going to get into that, but it has uh, specific you know, functions that just basically set up different things, uh, and you can see that here, where I, m where I mentioned in the previous video that, that uh, characters have a critical state where they're basically low on health, this is where that comes in. So let's go back. Where exactly all of these uh, functions like following and, sh and shooting and stuff comes in is in the character class. The player inherits from this class, enemies inherit from this class, everything inherits from this class, and to actually define the behavior of um, these characters, I use something called behaviors. Um, well, I use something called a behavior tree, as well as something called behaviors that get set into that tree. So the behavior tree is, um, you can think of a behavior tree kind of like switches like okay say you have light switches on the wall and you flip the first light switch and the ceiling fan comes on and the light comes on you flip the second light switch and all the electricity in the room um, turns off so you can flip these switches in different states to do different things obviously if the electricity isn't on then it doesn't matter but just for the sake of the argument let's say you can flip off all the electricity in the room except for the ceiling fan with the second switch or flip on all of the lights and the ceiling fan with the first switch. So you have different states here, right? You can flip on the electricity and flip on the light. You can flip off the light and keep the electricity on, etc., etc. That's what a behavior tree in my example is. This isn't really a classical behavior tree or, or a correct behavior tree. I don't, I didn't really see the need to implement an actual like branching decision tree. But this is just basically um, where I can have a di different branches of behavior, like for example. Um, chase an enemy, uh, chase a target, or a, let's say shoot at a target and follow the player. Like Let's say we have an NPC that can follow you. We can have him shoot at the enemies that are near him as well as follow the player around. So we have two different branches that are both can be activated or deactivated at will. So if the enemy takes damage, then he might deactivate shooting. Uh, well, if his gun takes damage, then he would deactivate shooting. If he if he takes damage, then he would deactivate following, but he can still shoot while he's you know down on the ground or whatever. So you can have these kind of multiple states that can be you know toggled at will, and that's where toggling branches come in, as well as activating branches, deactivating branches, and then we also can add um, behaviors to branches, and that's where the real meat of the character system comes in, because each behavior has different states. I'm sorry, different variables that concern that behavior. So for example, for the following, um, the flying follow class or fly, flying follow behavior, we have the maximum distance an enemy should get from the target, the minimum distance an enemy should be from the target, uh, how much friction to apply when, you know, movement, like if it, if it stops following, it, it does it, you know, slow down gradually, does it speed up, 
um, how much, how fast it approaches, what the maximum speed is, uh, what the Z offset from the uh, target should be. So for example, the enemy, the sentry follows you around. It basically stays two units above you um, because obviously it's, it's following. It doesn't make sense if it would stay on the ground level. It's trying to stay above you. So you can have different um, variables according to each class like this. We also have one that uh, handles collision. So what should happen if an enemy or a character collides with an object? Then we can say, okay, on, on collision, we want him to do nothing, or we want him to bounce, or we want him to get damaged, or we want him to stick to the object, or we want him to hug the object, or to explode, or whatever. So these are all, um, I haven't implemented pretty much any of these other than like shoot, aim, and follow fly. So I haven't implemented a lot of these, but the point is that anything that is kind of dynamic other than, you know, a normal NPC that just talks to you, but like an actual, you know, thing that walks around and, and follows you or, or can trigger switches or whatever, that can be a behavior that basically looks for all nearby switches and triggers them. Now, you might be wondering, well, how does, how do the behaviors actually happen? Well, that happens in the update function. Um, so you kind of see that I'm, I'm splitting this up in kind of an odd way. Uh, I have basically a behaviors class that is kind of like a folder for all of my behaviors. I don't actually implement this class in any way. It's, it's just a folder. So I can say, um, for example, self.behaviortree.addBehavior. So you can see um, one of the main things, or main reasons I went ahead and refactored all my code in Gearend, which only took, it didn't take too long. It took a few days, maybe a couple, oh, a week. but one week <laughs> around like a you know some some time but one of the good things about this is that I can type self dot and it will go ahead and tell me all of my variables tell me all my functions it's really useful and inheritance is also very useful for enemies because I can do something like this self dot behavior tree dot add behavior and then I provide the type of behavior I want it to um, to for the character or enemy to follow so I say self dot behaviors Dot, and then I see all of my behaviors. So I say, okay, well, I want them to. Uh, let's have them. Uh, let's have them. I don't have that many useful behaviors right now. Let's have them uh, aim. Let's have them aim at the at the target. And so the target. Um, actually, there's no real arguments for this function other than the target, which actually is is handled uh, in the enemy. So I have to kind of. I haven't like. The, the reason I have a target argument here is because you might want an enemy or a character to aim at one object while doing another action toward another object. Like, for example, you might want a character or a NPC to follow the player but shoot at enemies. So aiming would be, you know, if you set it to none, then it'll just get the nearest enemy. Whereas if you have the follow fly uh, function, then uh, you can provide the you know, target to be the, the player. You know, that's just an example. So that's an exa another example. We could have a, add a branch to the tree where we have shoot, we have a, a an aim, uh, I'm sorry, a shoot branch, we have a follow the player branch, and we have a follow the uh, enemy, you know, follow enemies branch. So we can say if you're, um, if you have a certain amount of health or if you're nearby an enemy, then go ahead, follow enemies. Go with that branch. If you're, uh, the, if you get too far away from a player, then switch off the follow player branch uh, follow the enemy branch and switch on the follow player branch. So this overall allows us to do something like this, where basically we're getting very little. We're having actual an actually small amount of code um, that isn't being recycled. Um, and in this code, this is for the second century. We get the follow behavior by asking the behavior tree to get it for us. We provide the kind of behavior it is, which is follow fly. We could also, you know, this being an instance of a class, we can also store the reference. To the behavior like that, and then we can, you know, grab it like so. So that's you know two ways to do it. Um, I just implemented the get behavior class, just kind of keep it encapsulated, keep it kind of locked in, and and you know, kind of keep the code together. Um, so we say, you know, this is kind of a easy example. We get the behavior of the follow fly uh, class, and then we say if the character is critical, then we speed up the. Uh, Blah. We speed up the follow behavior's maximum speed. That's it. That is all of the code that basically makes the enemy speed up if he gets critical, if he's low on health, and the character class itself handles everything else when it comes to actually 
moving around, actually following, actually shooting, all of that stuff. Whew, um, I feel like I wanted to talk about something else, but I, I don't remember offhand what it was. I, it might have been the weapons class. Uh, I think I wanted to talk about the BG helper module, but that is for another video, another day for another video. So we'll uh, forego that for now. Oh, yeah, one, one last thing. Pie charm is awesome. I just want to let that put that out there, let that sink in. Uh, it's really a nice IDE. I like it a lot. Um, someone mentioned that I, IntelliJ ID, idea. I think this is based off of that. But it's say, they said like IntelliJ is the Notepad plus plus to the Pi Charms Notepad. So like apparently IntelliJ is like far better or you know more advanced. But I, I'm just liking Pi Charm overall. Um, it's got a lot of cool stuff. You know, if if you are starting starting a new project in Blender and you're able to um, you know do mutation with mutating objects uh, to use classes, I would recommend it if only to have this level of ability to re reuse code easily, uh, being able to re uh, to overload code easily, um, having a local history so you can keep track of what changes you made to your um, I mean, you know, that that's just sick. That's just that's amazing that I can go back and see all of the changes. I think it's the minimum is or maximum is five days, five working days. Um, but you can see all the changes I've made to Garand over the past, you know, day or so, and it, it's amazing that it's, it's doing it like by step by step. Um, let me see. Okay, for a second I got worried. Uh, yeah, it's crazy that you can see it step by step. You can see the diffs. You can see the difference uh, in... Yeah, you can see that, that change. I, just, I made that um, like 20 minutes ago or 10 minutes ago where I add spaces to all of these comments. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. And you can go back way back. This is back in on the 3rd of July. So this is a few days ago. You can see all of the code I've changed. Um... I added, I added a couple classes or modules to the BG Helper module. I added uh, some stuff. I changed some stuff. And you can see the differences. Uh, well, not too much here, <laughs> but you can see the differences between um, yeah what what I've done over the past um, you know a few days. And you can revert. You can go ahead and revert to uh, a past state, a past status. So that's really nice. It's really nice. I would just recommend that you check it out if you haven't already. It's really cool. Okay. Well. That's it. Thank you very much for contacting. <laughs> Thank you very much for talking. Thank you very much for, for listening to me ramble and rant here about Gearend. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to continue making things and uh, we'll you'll be able to play it and have fun with it. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching. You have fun. See ya.